In today's video, I want to walk you through a case study of a real patient from my office, a 52-year-old woman with Hashimoto's and, of course, a few other symptoms like anxiety and fatigue and brain fog. I want to walk you through her history, some of her labs, and show you what her treatment response was and, and share with you some things I think you can learn that can help you with your Hashimoto's. All right, so again, this is a 52-year-old woman from my office. Uh, she's been diagnosed with Hashimoto's, and let me kind of get it situated here. So let's look at a little bit of her history. So the history is always extremely important uh, when I'm working up any type of patient, whether it's Hashimoto's or Parkinson's or autism, because a lot of times the clues to what's going on and what you need to do are in the history. So here we go. Uh, back in 2017, she had the worst sinus infection ever. She took azithromycin for that, and she said she's never felt the same after that. Now, why would that be? Well, number one, sinus infections, bacterial infections can stimulate cross-reaction. Now, if you guys have been on my channel very long, you know I've talked about cross-reaction a lot. Uh, cross-reaction occurs when the antibodies for one thing that your immune system makes can attach to another thing. And that can lead to autoimmunity. It can lead to a lot of different problems. So that's one possible reason why she never felt the same after that. Of course, we all know that uh, antibiotics tend to have a negative effect on your gut and your microbiome as well. So maybe that's it. She always feels like her nose is running, uh, and she feels like she became hyper-irritable. Okay, those are the potential things that I'm thinking about. Now, the year after that, she went into perimenopause, and she had some regular bleeding, and that led to getting a hysterectomy, a polypectomy, uh, and a DNC. So, you know, a very, very big deal. Now, perimenopause is also a very uh, common time that Hashimoto's is triggered. I have a video on that about how Hashimoto's is very often triggered during pregnancy and perimenopause and puberty. So perhaps this is where uh, that kind of pushed her over the edge, and that's when the Hashimoto's came into full bloom. Now, at that time, she was also diagnosed with low vitamin D. You see that in autoimmune patients almost all the time. Low ferritin, which is iron. And her voice was gruff at the time, and her voice was low. Now, that's a little telltale sign to tell you uh, that she may have had a little bit of a swollen thyroid gland and it was causing a little pressure on her vocal cords. Now, that's not the way it is now, and it's not like she has a true goiter, but with Hashimoto's, well, as Hashimoto's flares up and, and calms down and flares up and calms down, you can get a, a legitimate literal swelling of your thyroid gland. Okay, in 2021, a few years after that, she was complaining of fatigue and food sensitivities and brain fog where you just can't think right having difficulty recalling information, and a, a PA that she saw uh, did thyroid antibody testing, and what do you think they found? <laughs> thyroglobulin antibodies elevated at 2,500, which is really, really, really high thyroglobulin antibodies. And of course, if you have those, that means you have Hashimoto's. Now, it doesn't mean you have hypothyroidism, because you guys remember, I've talked about this a bunch of times. I've got videos on that where we talked about there's a spectrum, right? There's euthyroid Hashimoto's, there's subclinical Hashimoto's, and then there's overt hypothyroid Hashimoto's. Her TPO antibodies were a little bit elevated at 40, but those thyroglobal antibodies are very elevated. And I'm just going to tell you, anytime I see thyroglobal antibodies in the thousands, my first thought is she might have cancer. And the reason I say that is I've had a few cases over the years, now there's a little bit in the literature as well, about how really, really high thyroglobal antibodies can be a sign of some type of thyroid or parathyroid uh, malignancy. Now, her ferritin was 21 at this time. That's bad. Even if the reference range is 15 to 150, a ferritin of 21 is very, very bad because uh, pretty much the literature shows, and my rule of thumb is, if you are a woman and you're having menstrual periods, it's got to be at least 50. If you're not having menstrual periods, it should be closer to 100. So 21 is bad because uh, that's iron. That's 22% of your body's iron reflected in that test. And so iron's necessary for energy production. It's necessary for hemoglobin production. You have to have it to make dopamine and serotonin. So it's a big deal. Uh, it's not iron deficiency because it's not outside the reference range, but it's a reference range because we refer to it, right? It's still a very, very bad level of uh, uh, ferritin. Now, this was the first time anybody ever tested anything beyond TSH. And this is so important because you can have euthyroid Hashimoto's, which means Antibodies are elevated. That's all you need for it to be causing problems, for you to feel bad. I got a lot of different videos that explain that. You do not have to be overtly hypothyroid where your TSH is high. Okay, all you have to have is the antibodies. And who knows? She may have had the antibodies since 2017, 2018. Uh, for most people, it takes about seven to 10 years to finally get diagnosed with Hashimoto's. So she may, odds are she's had those antibodies uh, for quite a while. 
She had gained a lot of weight in 2021, her highest weight ever at 203 pounds, so she's concerned about that. Uh, she was tested for and treated with uh, for SIBO with antibiotics, but I want to get off on that. Now, a long story shorter, uh, she was given thyroid hormones. She was given, given just T3. Now, I've got some videos on that that I just did. Um, taking T3 by itself is a real gamble in my experience, in my opinion, because it's impossible to replicate the body's natural T3 uh, production distribution process. It's very, very difficult. And I think whoever told her to do this kind of made a mistake uh, because they didn't really dig for why was her T3 low. Now, your total T3 can be low and your free T3 can be fine. Uh, they get kind of caught up in this whole reverse T3 thing. And I don't want to you know, redo a video I just did, but she was given a T3 synthetic and then she was switched from that to Cytomel, which is a prescription uh, T3. And she did not do well with that. She had a lot of neurocognitive and emotional symptoms, including crying and dark thoughts and brain fog. And I'll tell you why. It's because she didn't need it. Uh, that wasn't necessary. And if you take a hormone that you don't need, uh, it's very likely going to cause problems. And in fact, what it can do, and I guess I need to put up another video on this. It's kind of rare. But if you take T3 and it makes you worse, then you definitely don't need it. And what it's doing is it's probably down-regulating and dampening and squashing your thyroid uh, receptors, your thyroid hormone receptors, because they can't handle and aren't designed to handle just a deluge or a flood of uh, T3. And if you're taking Cytomel and T3 that you don't need, that can happen. And the sign of it is you take it and you feel worse. You don't necessarily become hyperthyroid. In fact, you can become more hypothyroid because of that receptor down-regulation. So remember that. So she tried lowering the dose. That didn't help, and that could, have, could not have helped because the receptors have been so down-regulated, it's going to take them a while to essentially uh, recalibrate uh, to less T3. Now, she's completely off T3. She's been feeling bloated, having weight gain. And so what do we do, right? Well, she presents to me with anxiety. Brain's firing too fast, ruminating. There's a bunch of different things that can, that can cause that. She has fatigue. Again, that could be the ferritin. That could be the thyroid hormone uh, receptor problem. That could be a bunch of different things. She has a foggy brain. Again, that could be from neuroinflammation, could be nutrient deficiencies, could be a bunch of different things, but we're going to have to figure that out. She has a sleep disturbance. She has a hard time sleeping. She's getting hot flashes. She's perimenopausal. Now, she also has some very significant uh, uh, bloating, and heartburn. The heartburn's so bad that it often wakes her up at night. And that, she has developed a little tickle in her throat over the last year or two, uh, which is reflux. And that's going to have to get dealt with. All right, so I'm going to skip a lot of things and just show you a couple of really, really important uh, testing things that we did to kind of shed a lot of light on this. So here's her pre-treatment labs, this lady with Hashimoto's. There is her ferritin, right? A ferritin of 14. Now, again, you see the standard range, 12 to 252. Think about how wide that is. Okay, just think about that. That's incredibly wide. And I'm telling you, a ferritin of 14 is not good. It's not, well, it may be normal, but it is not healthy and it's not good. And that's going to have to get fixed because if we've got to get it to at least 50 or 75. And we're going to have to do that with the right type of iron supplementation. Um, and then look at this, her thyroglobulin antibodies, 1,999. That's very high. Okay, now, 2,500 is high. This is also very high. And the point I want you to, to see right now, I don't know if this is going to work, but we're going to try. You see how it says this test was performed using the Siemens Centaur Atelica immunoassay methodology. Okay, remember that because you cannot compare antibody results from this method with another method. It's apples and oranges. So we can only compare antibody results or whether antibodies went down or not by looking at the same test methodology because there's about a hundred different ways you can test these antibodies and you have to just make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Okay, so she doesn't have thyroid peroxide antibodies, she has thyroid globulin antibodies. And I'm going to be honest with you guys, I said you're going to have to go get a thyroid ultrasound and make sure that your thyroid is okay and that there's no sign of malignancy because that really concerns me. She did that, thyroid was clear, I said okay, well then your immune system is got to be way out of control, got to be crazy. So what did we do? Well, we did a little bit of testing. We did, uh, you guys have probably heard me talk, this, talk about this before, we did a multiple tissue or multiple autoimmune reactivity screen. Now, <clears throat> now I'm showing you guys this lab. I don't have any financial interest in this. No one pays me. I don't get any discounts or whatever. This is just testing that I do. And I want to walk you through this real quickly. Uh, so this is a, a, a test that looks for 
antibodies for, uh, I think it's about 25, 26 different tissue antibodies. And if they're elevated, right, out of range or really close to being out of range, like they're equivocal, then that is significant for us. Now, as you can see with her, she had a couple things show up. First thing that showed up was 21 hydroxylase or adrenal cortex antibodies. Now that concerns me because she has fatigue and we're gonna have to do a little follow-up testing on this. The next thing that showed up was cytochrome P450 and hepatocytes or liver cells. Well, that's not great, but I'm not so concerned about that one because her liver enzyme testing, the AST, ALT, all that was fine. So I don't think she's having active, like, you know, destruction. However, her immune system is targeting that. And I'll let you in a little clue. There's a food that helps this and this cross-react, okay? That is gluten. So those tissue antibodies cross-react with gluten and vice versa. So it could be the fact that she's still eating gluten. I didn't tell you guys that earlier, but I'm telling you now. That could be why she has uh, both of these antibodies. Now, we did do some follow-up testing. I'll go ahead and tell you what it was. I did an ACTH and a morning cortisol to find out, hey, is her adrenal circuit working? And it was. Um, and then if you'll see down here at the bottom, so thyroglobulin antibodies on this lab's method, they're also very high. They're four times the reference range. And, but she also had this thing here, which is an IA2 antibody. It's an insulin receptor antibody. And that can show up in people that have type 1 diabetes. Again, she has fatigue. I'm wondering, gosh, could that be it? Well, her glucose levels weren't really crazy, but I wanted to do the follow-up testing to find out is there enough tissue damage related to the adrenal glands and the insulin receptor that we're seeing something, not at the uh, islet cell antibodies, right? And so we did the ACTH and AM cortisol, and it was fine because these antibodies have a predictive power. And what that means is if they show up and they're high now, if you don't do anything, there's a very high chance it's actually eventually going to cause tissue damage, and now you're going to have a full-blown autoimmune disease just not, and not just autoimmunity, right? So anyway, we did the follow-up testing. Both of those were fine, but we can see that our thyroglobulin antibodies are very high. Okay, now, we also did this thing called a comprehensive lymphocyte immunophenotyping test, or uh, lymphocyte map uh, for short, and I guess I'll walk you through this a little bit, okay? So you'll notice that her T-cell percent is borderline high. Her total B-cells are borderline low. That's an imbalance, so she's a little bit T-cell dominant. She's got a CD4 percent that is definitely high and a CD8 uh, count that's a little bit low. So this is our immune system fingerprint test, right? Now, obviously, looking at it, her results don't look crazy. However, they're a little subtle. So the first teeter-totter we look at is T-cells and B-cells. Well, her T-cells are a little bit high, B-cells are a little bit low. The second teeter-totter we look at is CD4 and CD8. CD4 is a little bit high, CD8 is a little bit low. So we might want to do something therapeutically to try to restore that balance. Next thing we'll look at is the T helper 17. Now, T helper 17 is a villain when it comes to autoimmune diseases. It's really highly responsible for a lot of the tissue damage and inflammation that occurs. And her TH17, uh, the total count is borderline high and the percent is actually high. So her immune system is definitely not normal. Now, is it like the craziest thing we've ever seen? No, but for her, her fingerprint, her immunophenotype, that's what's happening. Oh yeah, the last thing is her total natural killer like T cells are a little bit close to being off. Uh, and I'm just gonna skip that for now. So, okay, and then we did treatment. Now, I'm not gonna tell you what the treatment was, and I know you may be looking for that because I don't want you trying to treat yourself, right? I have a lot of experience doing this and I have a, a lot of knowledge, to be honest. And I'm not gonna just tell you what we did because I don't need you going out thinking, oh, I can do that for me because that's not the way it works. You need to be worked up by someone who knows all the stuff that I've been doing here and let that person work with you and tell you uh, what you should be doing. I, again, I'm not going to tell you what the treatment was, but I do want to show you what's possible. Okay, so don't hate me, <laughs> but here's what's next. So after 60 days of treatment, okay, here's what we found. Now, those again are her pre-labs, right? The ferritin was really low. Thyroglobulin antibodies, really high. This is after 60 days of the treatment protocol that I designed based on her phenotype and her history and the other labs that we did. Now, her ferritin is now a 34. That's over 100% increase in her ferritin. That may not seem like a big deal, but with people whose ferritin is really low, <laughs> that kind of an increase is almost always going to give you uh, a symptomatic boost. You're almost always going to feel better. And it shows that she can absorb iron if she takes the right kind, and if she takes it in the right way, okay, that's very, very important. 
Now, the other important thing is, you can see her antibodies were almost 2,000. Okay, there's, there's me circling the 34. And then here we have those thyroglobulin antibodies. Now, look at that. Now they're 994, never been that low. They've dropped 49% in 60 days. Now, is that chance? No, it isn't. It's because we were doing the right things for her immune system to regulate it based on her phenotype and her history and her presentation, and that's the, that's the objective result that we got. Now, those numbers are cool, but we also have to match up the numbers with how the patient feels because if she's not feeling any better, okay, then this is kind of a moot point. So remember, I like to do my treatment plans in like 30-day chunks, and here we did 60 days of treatment. That's what I wanted to show you guys the follow-up. Not 30 days, but 60 days. So let's see how she did subjectively, right? Now, she's lost five pounds. Remember, she was really trying to lose weight. Uh, the reflux is gone for the most part because she found that the probiotics she was taking was causing a huge problem. And I have to say that in almost every autoimmune case I've ever treated, they're almost always taking something that is making them worse. They just didn't know it. Now, she's also reporting being more clear-headed, and her fatigue has improved by 40%. That's pretty good, right? I mean, I, I'm, she's very happy. I'm very happy. So the point of today's video was not to teach you how to treat yourself, okay? The point of today's video was to show you what's possible if you find someone who knows all these things we've talked about, right? Now, what do they got to know? Well, they got to know what, how do I analyze someone's history, right? How do I know what labs to order? How do I interpret those labs that make sense for that person, not just $20,000 of labs? And do I know how to treat what I find on the labs? And how do I know, how do I set a bar if the patient is getting better? Those people are out there. You just got to make sure you find one. And don't be afraid to interview them and ask them questions and ask them if they know how to do this type of testing. Because if they do know how to do it, right, and they have experience, then there's a really good chance, at least a, a good chance, that if you have Hashimoto's and anxiety and some of the symptoms that this patient had, there's a good chance you can feel better too. Okay, uh, let me know, by the way, let me know in the comments if you guys like this type of video because I've got hundreds of these I could do. Uh, and if you do, I'll do them because I like talking about cases. I like sharing people. But just remember, I'm not going to be giving you, oh, here's the 10 things that you do to treat yourself because that I can't do. I just don't think that's a very... Uh, I'm not sure that's a very ethical thing to do. And I want you to be working with a professional, right? Someone who's experienced, someone who's smart, someone who's going to dig because everybody's unique. Even though you have Hashimoto's, your home of Hashimoto's is unique to you. So you got to find someone who respects that and knows that and is going to treat you like that. Okay, see you next time.